Zahir Haq, Professor Imran Rahman, Special Advisor to the Board of Trustees, Professor Muhammad Ibrahim, Head of the Department of General Education, Distinguished Guests, Respected Colleagues, and Dear Students. Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to a panel discussion on contemporary art scene in Bangladesh. It is organized by the General Education Department of University of Liberal Arts Bangladesh. Let me first say a few words about contemporary art in Bangladesh. The achievements of the newborn Bangladesh's art can now be summed up in three major trends. The figurative idioms of SM Sultan and Shah Buddin Ahmed, the contextual modernisms of Joinul Abidin, <coughs> Kanbul Hassan and Saif Abdin Ahmed, the abstract expressions of Muhammad Kibriya, Amir al-Islam and Murtaza Bashir. Artists who were at the apex of the modern art movement of the 60s are also the inheritors of the modern and pre-modern legacies of West Bengal, where Nandalal Bosch, Jamini Roy, and Rabindranath Tagore provided a ground for reorientation. It, is, it did not take much time for the artists to carve their respected niches, first in Pakistan and later in Bangladesh, showing an obvious bias towards experimentation. Groups of artists in Bangladesh and some others practicing abroad together gave shape to the developing art scene. If the modern media, specific artists, have their eyes set on the context of their own ecology, history, and cultural identity, the contemporary artists began to meld the contextual with the spirit of diversity. At present, two institutions are playing major roles in the development of contemporary art trends in Bangladesh. The Bengal Foundation and the Sandani Art Foundation. The Bengal Foundation, founded in 1986, is the first professional and dedicated platform for, for visual arts in Bangladesh. Business magnet Abul Khair Litu established the foundation out of personal interest in the arts and the vision of projecting a culture rich Bangladesh. The Sandani Art Foundation, founded in 2011 by the collector couple Nadia and Rajiv Sandani, it's a private foundation based in Dhaka that aims to increase artists' engagement between Bangladesh and the rest of the world. They provide production grants, residencies, education programs, and exhibitions to expand the creative horizons of Bangladeshi artists. The foundation produces the biannual Dhaka Art Summit, which is the world's largest non-commercial platform for South Asian art. Founders Rajiv and Nadia Sambani were recognized on the 2015 Top 200 Collectors List by Art News. Today's panel discussion will explore the current state of contemporary Bangladesh art and what makes it such a unique form of expression within the broader international contemporary art scene. I would like to request our Honorable Vice Chancellor, H.M. Zahir Haq, to uh, come on stage and inaugurate the event. Very good afternoon, everyone. Uh, actually, today I am very happy because we are going to have a very good and very fruitful session. Nowadays, we are suffering from different kinds of religious fundamentalism, different kinds of extremism. So I strongly believe that uh, we have to go for this sort of uh, events as much as we can. As an institution, our primary responsibility is to deal with uh, learning and teaching and research activities, which we do. At the same time, ULF also focuses on art and culture within our limitation. For example, we have, uh, our, we have an art club under which we organize different types of events every year. Then we have uh, media studies journalism under that department, our students and teachers organize street painting and also wall art and so on. So we believe that uh, this sort of event are very useful for both our students and faculty members. And therefore, uh, we invited you here. I'd like to thank uh, the participants uh, of these events, in particular, uh, Nadia Andalif Prema, artist, I'd like to also thank uh, Mr. Tanji Mawaha, Chief uh, Curator of Bengal Foundation. My thanks to Nadia Samdani, co-founder of Samdani Art Foundation, and also co-founder of Dhaka Art Summit. 
My sincere thanks to Ms. Diana Campbell and uh, the also co-founder of Dhaka Art Summit. And of course, my thanks to my colleague, Syed Madhur Islam. I wish uh, success of this event. Very, very unfortunately, I, would, uh, I will not be able to you know, join this event because I have another meeting. And for that, I am sorry. And I would like to again thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vice Chancellor Sir, for the warm welcome. Um, I would now like to invite our panelists uh, to the stage. Uh, Ms. Nadia Samdani, co-founder and president of the Samdani Art Foundation. <laughs> Ms. Diana Campbell, chief curator of Taka Art Summit. <laughs> Ms. Nadia Andali Prima, eminent visual artist. Uh, Mr. Tanzi Bohab, Chief Curator of Bengal Foundation. <laughs> and Professor Syed Manzurul Islam, Art Critique. <laughs> Today's panel discussion will be moderated by Mustafa Zaman, artist, art critique, and editor of the upcoming magazine, Art Plus. Bangladesh art scene, <clears throat> particularly the modern art scene of the 1960s when um, Kamran Hassan and uh, the figure in Baston consisted of works by Kamran Hassan and, uh, is it working? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so Kamran Hassan and uh, Zainul Abedin and also uh, uh, the geometrically, uh, and also I'm just trying to uh, lay out the background of how contemporary art sort of emerged in the 1980s and the 1990s uh, through uh, the concepts and ideas developed uh, uh, by the young artists, young stars who emerged in the 1990s, 1980s and also um, uh, in today's Bangladesh. So uh, the abstract movement that sort of came into, sprang into view uh, back in 1960s, uh, there, there was these two ways of you know, negotiating modern art. So that, that came under the uh, umbrella concept of modern art, umbrella word modern art. Now we have this umbrella word um, uh, contemporary art because it is sort of challenges the ideas of uh, you know medium specific specificity and also form specific specificity introduced by modern artists. So now we have uh, all sorts of variegated practices here in Bangladesh, like practiced by youngsters and also people like me. And here we have one representative of the of today's art scene, Nazi Andali Prima. And um, I think we would start off with uh, the concept of whether Bangladesh has a particular um, characteristic which we can refer to constantly. Whether we have, a, have a, 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 an identity of our own. Uh, so I'll ask Munzur Islam, who is the preeminent uh, uh, art writer of Bangladesh, uh, who's been writing uh, for the last 50 years, as, as he said earlier uh, during the conversation that he's first read his, uh, uh, an important paper, a ship of back in, in the 1960. Uh, now okay. I, I published, you in, published uh, paper on, on in, uh, it was a Pakistan Observer, I think. Okay. In 1968. So, so, back so, I was, so I was hoping that because of my age, I would be the last to speak. <laughs> you are you are one of the most important art writers. So, so I hope that by the time you, you, you exhaust the panel, I will not have to speak anymore. <laughs> yeah, I believe Bangladesh has um, uh, made its own art. Uh, there is something called Bangladeshi art, not doubt about it. Why do I say that? Because if you look at contemporary Indian art, you say there are very strong emphasis on narrative, on the descriptive. Whereas we have somehow decided that our art should be epiphanic. We like to capture a moment, a momentary experience, whereas they go on narrating, because their modernism has evolved in conversation with European modernism. 
So the reflection of European understanding of modernism is very much in Indian modernism was in the beginning. Along the line, India decided what in a way. So, so what happened there was at a certain stage they decided that Indianness has to be reflected. So by reflecting the Indianness through narrative content, they have become very narrative in that sense. Whereas from the very beginning, we decided to imprint our landscape, our way of life, our thinking, our folk ways into our painting. So it's very good that two of our pioneer artists who shaped Bangladeshi ethos of art have been two persons who believed in the imagination and the strength of the folk art, General Avidin and Kamrul Hassan. They were also modernists per se, because modernism is not simply abstraction or the way you understand alienation in our time or all the other aspects of modernism we talk about. What modernism relate to time, how you look at time as a changing concept, how you relate to what is called flux, which is something that time ensures. And this is what we do in tandem with our understanding of tradition. Because tradition grows out of a realization of the necessity of locating yourself in space and time. No tradition is without space or without an understanding of time. So our modernism has been to reflect how our culture can be accommodated in our painting. Our way of life can be accommodated, how our myths and beliefs and the very strong presence of the magical in folk imagination can also be represented in our painting. In the paintings of Kamrul Hassan, and Zonil uh, SM Sultan has been mentioned. Salima began by mentioning SM Sultan. I believe the post-colonial painter uh, without any comparison in this subcontinent. And his imagination of the village has been a very post-colonial village where the deprivation of colonization are absent, where people are strong and healthy, where the peasant imagination is reproductive and recreative of a new tradition, a celebration of strength, if you will, a celebration of health, a celebration of the old idea of golden Bengals plenty. And they, these um, gave us an understanding of life in terms of plenty, in terms of folkways, in terms of magic, in terms of mystery, in terms of myth. And these, the other artists carried and accommodated in their artwork. Kibria has been mentioned, right? Kibria apparently is a very abstract painter. And you mentioned the geometric understanding of art. He reflects on the he reflects the geometri geometricization of art. But Kibria's colors are very much entrenched in nature. He takes directly from nature. So his art is not um, detached from our reality whether you leave this reality in the villages or in the cities. And this constant struggling of the rural and the, uh, and the urban is very significant in our art. Abdul Razak is a man who instantly goes to the villages and comes back to the city. He's one of our best artists of the urban imagination. And each artist has created an imaginary which works as a point of reference. So we are never really detached from our culture, tradition, our art forms, and see how the Shokher Hari and the Nakshi Katha, all these are reflected in our compositions. Um, somebody like uh, Farida Zaman, somebody like uh, Rokhaya Sultana, they will go back to uh, all these traditions and take from the existing artworks all around. So when, uh, whenever there is an even uh, inspiration of how the instrumental art also reflects our not very art friendly <laughs> <laughs> microphones. Anyway, I'll stop here. Uh, what is this is a signal. So we might have to stop. Uh, we stop here by saying uh, just one thing that indeed we have a Bangladeshi art. And if you ask me to categorize Bangladeshi art, I will say it is both local and global in aspiration. 
it is both traditional and modern at the same time. It is both, both folk and urban and urban folk at the same time. And it is something which cross cuts the boundaries of class, ethnicity, gender. And if you talk about gender, I suppose Prima can talk about the representation of gender. This is one aspect of our modernism. We have not categorized women as providers within the house. Women are very strong presence in Esam Sultan, almost like matriarchs that dominate the campus. Yeah. So this is one aspect of our modernism. Okay. Yeah, so you have, you have, you have focused on the, uh, beautifully focused on the situatedness of, of yes. modern and contemporary yes. mm, art, <coughs> art works of our yeah. uh, of Bangladesh. And so uh, the I'd distinction like you made between modern and contemporary is very good. Modern also defines an attitude. Yeah. Modern defines a philosophy which has been supplemented by or supplanted by postmodern. Postmodern and post-postmodern. Post-postmodern. And you can, you can post as many posts you like and you can have yeah. post-post <laughs> exactly. exactly. But contemporary and always, defines, yeah. Yeah. always defines the logic of time. It is yeah. now and here. Now That's and contemporary. Here. Yeah. Yeah. And contemporary is also about, you know, the very native practices that we see emerging out of the uh, today's milieu, you know, like uh, technology is dark, you have video art now, you have installation, and uh, you came up with this wonderful trope uh, in Bangla, in transliteration. Uh, installation was translated into sthapana, which was a, which stuck sort of, it still stays, we still use it in Bangla um, art writing. So thanks to you, and I would um, ask, um, uh, I mean, I would I'll, I'll go to uh, Diana now, who is uh, uh, the curator of Dhaka Art Summit, which is a platform. I talked a little bit about platform here because uh, we've got people from representing those platforms. Because platforms is a model where all sort of uh, convergences happen. Like uh, artists are coming from outside, from different regions, uh, to be represented there, and also um, it is a this is where uh, professionals get together to talk about art, to uh, you know uh, present their papers. So Asian art, after Asian art Biennale, which is the longest running Biennale of our country, we sort of Samdani Foundation uh, <coughs> represent this wonderful platform called uh, uh, DAS Dhaka Art Summit, uh, which has. Uh, uh, which is ready to um, uh, go into it, their fourth uh, edition uh, after two months, in two months, and uh, in three months, in February. And I would like to, um, I would like to ask Diana whether she will be able to reflect on how Bangladesh artists are negotiating Western modern and contemporary practices. So that is another, another aspect of Bangladesh's art, because the patterns that we see now emerging, and also the patterns that we have already seen in, in modern practices, uh, sort of simultaneously negotiate both the local trends, as, as uh, uh, our teacher, uh, uh, Rever revered uh, uh, art writer explained, and uh, it also simultaneously negotiate Western art, Western trends, Western languages, uh, ideas, tropes, visual models. I want to back up just a little bit uh, to, to continue on I mean, what you said was so beautiful and so true. Um, but you mentioned the idea of time, you mentioned the idea of location, you mentioned the idea of imagination. Something that I find quite fascinating about Bangladesh's history is actually it's not charting itself to the West. So if we look at the golden age of the Shilpakala Academy, which I would probably call 1974 to 1991, and you look at where the Shilpakala Academy was organizing exhibitions. It was in Dresden, it was in Yugoslavia, it was in Bulgaria, it was in China in 1989. You know, it was, you kind of had this non-aligned aesthetic happening. Even if you look at the Asian Art Biennale, and you look, I mean, even that idea, which came in 1980 during Syed Jehangir's visit to Fukuoka, that idea to chart Bangladesh relative to Asia and not relative to the UK or America, that was quite, I mean, again, the politics of the time, but I would say quite a um, bold and lasting move. Um, so what I find interesting now, yes, a lot of the exchange is happening with the West, but if you look at the exchange, again, I'm selfishly implicated in this, but if you look at the exchange between the Philippines 
and Bangladesh. Quite fascinating, you visit Alok Roy, he can tell you about working with Filipino artists in camps at that time. You can see remnants of this in the collection of the Shopakala Academy, because there are works of Filipino art in the collection of the Shopakala Academy. And if you, I know that the Bengal Foundation is doing exchange with Korea and with Taiwan. I know that there's young uh, artists from uh, Bangladesh that have participated in biennials in China. I think that, you know, at least from our side with the Dhaka Art Summit, we think this Western exchange has been completely overblown. It's also a bit uh, colonial in the way that these um, exchanges happen. I can get into that uh, more, but I think it, it's, it's very interesting to look past this West and uh, Bangladesh trope because Bangladesh has a far more deep and interesting network if you look relative to other Asian or uh, post-Soviet neighbors. You wrote a long time ago. In an inter interview with me, you, you said South Asia is a zone that has had international contact for centuries. It is true. And uh, this exchange is ev everywhere. It's, it's, it's a reality, the exchanges that goes on. And uh, through those exchanges, the learnings that sort of seep into the art scene, into our modern art scene, also into our contemporary art scene. So uh, would Nazia be ready to uh, reflect on that? I missed it. I thought that you were going to ask it too far, so that was <laughs> in my thoughts. So can you just... Uh, uh, how contemporary art is, 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 is still connected to uh, the global art scene, but it has a character of its own. So we were trying to define the character by way of, uh, you know, uh, de deciding all those connections and how it is connected to the West. Well, uh, for me, I believe that uh, everything is connected. Uh, in certain way and if we can create a context and reflect on that experience of context I think we can make it uh, not like an art but we can express it the way we want to do it as uh, other speakers say that uh, it's actually a collage of experiences I believe for me actually personally I make a narration from the collage of experience that I got from my own land and when I travel inside, outside my own country and also abroad. So it's actually the images and the experiences and the dialogue and the mixture that I had with the other culture is bringing me back. Even if artists don't come back, stay outside. Say for instance, we have artists like Munirul Islam Shahid Kabir who lived abroad for long, but yet they are not away from the contemporary practice or the local sequence. So it's always there. It's always in the artistic expression that yet they are traditional, yet they are contemporary, yet they are modern. They actually represent contemporary. So this is a process to be honest that it goes on and on. It is like like Nowadays, I believe that every aspect, not only art as a fine art, every creative process got this aspect of uh, fluidity. So it goes around. So it's like it's never changed. It's rather evolve and follow. And therefore, it actually, somebody is waving hands. Okay. So uh, actually, uh, create an impact to the social uh, to make a social narration. So it is it is very much necessary to concentrate in the journey and be in the process. It's, it's, it, it doesn't matter uh, if it is contemporary, modern, or traditional for me, to be honest. So um, I'll resort to Nadia Sundari now, because you have, uh, you are one of the main persons Together, you and your husband together uh, uh, came up with this idea of DAS, which, which serves as a platform for contemporary artists in Bangladesh. And also, uh, you bring in artists from the region and also beyond the region. So, the borders that we assume exist, I mean, they exist in reality, but in terms of, uh, you know, when you think about people, you know, when we think uh, the borders seems very, very porous because ideas travel. And now you have this international platform. And um, what was your object behind it? It's a simple question because people would love to uh, know it from you. Okay, thank you. 
Um, so Rajiv and I founded uh, the Samdani Art Foundation in 2011, keeping in mind that we wanted to support and promote and give a platform for South Asian art. Um, because uh, we have been collecting over the years and we, through travel, um, traveling all over the world to different biennials, exhibitions, art fairs, we saw that there was a lack of um, Bangladeshi art mainly. And that made us feel that, you know, we do have a Bangladeshi art scene, we have a very vibrant art scene locally, but why doesn't anybody know about it? Why don't they have a platform internationally? So um, that's how the idea of the foundation started. Um, so, but before the foundation, we were supporting artists individually, separately, in small ways, but we realized that, no, we need to do something properly. Um, so that's how the foundation was born. And then the idea of the Talk Art Summit came that <clears throat> it should be a platform where we were thinking that, you know, if we would send artists for scholarships, which we were abroad, but how many can we send? So the idea, was that we wanted to create a platform where we would showcase the arts of Bangladesh and South Asia where people from all over the world could come and see and discover artists. And um, as you know, Bangladesh, we don't have, I mean, where our infrastructure is not as developed as the other countries across the world, and we don't have any dedicated um, art museum, contemporary art museum, so, and also the internet wasn't really a very um, effective place for people to do research. So we figured that, you know, if we do the Talk Art Summit and where we invite all kind of researchers, curators, artists, critics from all over the world, it would be a platform. And although we have had three editions and we're still new, we're, we're new to the, uh, for this, we're still young, but the impact that it has internationally, I think, I mean, it is very gratifying for us because it is, for us as founders, we, it is not commercial, it is, it's purely foundation. We don't have, we've never, um, we've, uh, it's, all, oh, it's always been the intention that we want to support artists and just support them. And we've, uh, it was never that, you know, in the future we want to make it a business platform or anything of that sort. So, you know, over the years now that we've seen that, you know, we see Bangladesh's presence everywhere. We see young artists going to major Biennale shows. Even we've seen that um, Bangladeshi modernists are now being acquired by international museums. So these are the most gratifying things um, as patrons that we can feel. So three back-to-back -back, um, editions really leaves an impact on the international art scene because you know uh, Bangladeshi art, art um, arts artworks are being sought after now. So and I would like to uh, come back to Munzur Islam on the question of categories because we have this new category. Uh, uh, called uh, uh, South Asian art. And we also have, I mean, you talked about uh, the nature of Bangladeshi art. Uh, and that is also a category that we would like to stick to. So, is, is this a problem that we have so many categories now out in the open? Or is it always, has it always been like this that uh, we would, uh, it's been pluralistic from the, from the beginning? Or should we, uh, choose one and leave another? No, I suppose categories, the more they are, the more to show the strength of the art that we are talking about. Uh, categories means you have invested so much of your attention to details or to the abstract idea or to the philosophy of the thing that you create so that you have to really have categories of existence. So categories I don't have any problem with is how you use the categories in defining the art. I suppose one way of defining an art or an artwork or art itself is through a holistic method, which we are practicing at the moment. Um, I assume that by categories you also mean suppose installation art. Mm -hmm. exactly. 
uh, installation art arose because of the need to register a different kind of voice in art. Uh, installation art, you cannot own it. And by definition, it is impermanent. You just uh, create an installation art, you have to really take it down. Unless you have a very big space to display it, which is very rare in our country. It is also an art of found objects, kind of a serendipity involved in creating this art. So it is a definition, different kind of art in which you have the joy of creating something dominating over the market value. In fact, installation art, I have never seen any being sold as gallery art is sold, right? So installation art defines our restlessness. It's also, it also represents the spirit of the new times. Remember the visual art coming into the scene, the visual age, the society of the spectacle bursting on us from the 1960s, 1780s, and which is a very different kind of experience. So these experiences have to be reflected in art. I can see in our very modern artists, like very young artists, they are representing these things, kind of a confusion, but also fusion. Fusion is sometimes confusion. <laughs> So like fusion music, you know, which is okay. A lot of people, the purists, would frown upon fusion music, but I welcome it. Because fusion music respects two traditions, and out of which it creates a different tradition. And fusion music has listeners. So this hybridity is a part of the living culture today. We live in hybrid buildings, we live in hybrid institutions. ULAB has a fall semester, which I don't know why it's a fall thing. Uh, except people's hair, nothing falls in the fall. <laughs> but it's a fall semester. I, I go by the hybridization. We live in a hybrid world. But it doesn't mean that art exhausts its potentials. Every categorization, I believe, opens up a different strength of art. So people pursue this strength. And one thing Diana says, and I like it very much, is that we, and this is what I'm trying to show uh, or, or say to the world for the last 40 years, is that our art has evolved from the needs of the land. Utility values first. Our Nakshi Katha had utility values, still have. Our Shwakir Haris have utility values. Um, our, um, what do they call these? Uh, Shika. Shika has utility values. So what, what it means is, or Shital Pati has utility values. Alpana has utility values, for God's sake. So art which reflects the need of a community to aestheticize its everydayness is art that survives. If art is detached from the needs of the community, if it is only an aesthetic product implanted on the society from abroad or outside, then it doesn't have a long shelf life. But when you say community, so it's, it's a totality that you... It's a totality of society, it's a nation. It's either a country, a country or a society, that totality. And, and within the community, you have to understand that ethnicity, race, gender, all have to have the same equal space. And I am happy to say that in our culture, we have that kind of expectation. It is not exclusive, it is very inclusive. You said the word in the beginning, pluralistic. Now, yeah. without pluralism, without multiplicity, without diversity, you cannot have a art. society will not survive. It, it, it does not. And by definition, art is something which is various. Yeah. I mean, I've come to, we have come yeah, to. I see uh, he's raising his hands. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's, 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 he's an interest that because we were talking about this uh, this particular issue of shifting. I would like to hear from the young people. Yeah, then. shifting now. So, <laughs> with your leave, I'll just shut up and I'll, um, I'll, I'll hear them. We will come back to you later uh, on this on this point. And um, Tanzim was talking about shifting knowledge, shifting identities, shifting uh, categories. So, I would like to hear about this uh, on this. I would like to. Like Tanzim to reflect on this. Thank you, Mr. I think uh, when we talk about dichotomy of uh, modernism and contemporary, I think uh, I'll just go back to uh, the practice of modernism specifically. Uh, I was talking with Ganesh Haloy a few months ago, and he was telling a very interesting thing that when we look at pre modernity, uh, there was not much hierarchy between the mediums at all when we see art and craft, artist and artisan, the overlap between with each other. But in contemporary practice and conversations, we keep utter viewers like cross pollination But it just ha happened way before uh, without much of hierarchy of the mediums. I think when we talk about contemporary, uh, of course, there are a few questions. 
Uh, is, is it anyhow a counter movement of modernism? Not at all. It's more like recontextualizing the history and expanding the history by just questioning few things. Uh, more, I uh, will say, in a reductionist approach. I mean, reduction in ambition is not, I think, always back to for a systemic growth. Uh, because when you talk about this infinite uh, optimism, uh, which is also from coming from past and modernism a little bit. Uh, and I'm not talking about this Derridian infinite uh, uh, deconstructivism too, uh, which is also a very utopian idea. But what I'm trying to say here, interestingly, uh, this time-bound idea of contemporary, how to renegotiate with the practice of the art world and with also your reality, is really important at this stage because uh, contemporary, especially Boris Groys, the way he say once, it's not living in a time, it's more like living with the time. That means having a certain kind of negotiation with the time, uh, having this constant dialogue with the time, or sometimes collaborating with the time. Uh, that's why when we talk about the later stage of modern art, we talk about this uh, issue of hierarchy and expansion of the practice, uh, more in a, a socio-political way, because there is an inclusion, a politics of inclusion on uh, utilizing resources and art work. Uh, and to be very specific, uh, we have a very interesting journey of contemporary art from late 80s. I mean, we can accumulate those knowledges. Uh, like the way Diana rightly said, Asian art been under played a huge role. I think there, there were many, many interesting collectives uh, who continuously raised uh, very important issues uh, strongly. There was Shomoy group who talked about Sthanin Pastobota, uh, which is like the ground, uh, situatedness, a ground reality, a location reality, site specificity, you may say. Uh, and also about indigenous knowledge, uh, how to repurpose indigenous knowledge. Because uh, mid 20th century was really interesting to look at, even if you look at global West, because in the West it was not only postmodernism. Uh, in the Western part it was postmodernism, but if we look back to Eastern part, then there was a post uh, socialism movement happening. And Borodin uh, Khan Jahangi, one of the critics, very interestingly talked about this indigenous modernism uh, long ago, during the time of internal colonization of the practice. So there is a specificity of modernist practice too, uh, and it will be a really exciting process to relocate the history, uh, to repurpose them at this point of particular point of time. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I will just pass it to the others. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I've, I'm, my observation is that, that we have scripted a modernity which is very, very exclusive because uh, it all boils down to, Dhaka's modernity boils down to flat color and geometry. I was talking to this uh, <laughs> artist. It's very wrong. Yeah, it's very wrong because modernity is, was plural from the beginning. So, uh, what would you uh, say to uh, our artists? When you, like, I mean, Islam used to think that uh, um, Zainul Abidin tried modernity, only modernism, modern language only once in his lifetime. Uh, from 1951 to 1953, when he was geometricizing everything, like uh, he was uh, basing everything on geometric uh, shapes. So, what would your response be to that? Very simple. I mean, modernity doesn't confine to one definition. Yeah. And it is also, as you mentioned, site specific. European modernism is not the same thing as Japanese modernism. Basically, this enlightenment project continues down to our time. You have to apply rationality and logic. If you can apply these two, if you can get over superstition, if you can get over your parochial sentiments, then you are a modern person. As a person who remains rooted to the tradition, remains rooted to the soil, then it aspires for the global and the international. That is a modern that is one aspect of modernism. When I teach literature, modern literature, I take at least two classes to define modernism. Even then I cannot, so I shall describe modernism. Modernism is not simply restricted to art and culture, but you have way of life, you have politics, you have all these things. So if you assume that modernism has to be one particular kind, which is geometric and all these things, then you are pursuing one slice of modernism, you are respecting forgetting that modernism is a whole concept. It's like seeing the elephant. Uh, when uh, blind people see the elephant, um, then they see parts of the elephant. So that's the whole idea. 
and just one second. And the last thing, I, I do not say anything to the artists. You know, I'm not the person to say any any artist what to do. I believe absolutely in creative freedom. So whatever they do, I engage with it. Sometimes I defer with it by respect the interpretation because every act of art, every uh, every artwork is an act of interpretation. And in the interpretation, it's always a mix. So many things come into play in an interpretative, interpretative act. So I really refrain from value judgment because in that sense, I'm a postmodernist. I do not believe in value judgments. I believe in appreciation and that's it. But that's part of uh, value judgment because when you appreciate something, yeah, I mean, you I have an advantage to that. But yeah. <laughs> But continuing on what both of you said, I think part of the problem in this description that you brought up about uh, modernism and Dhaka being flat color and geometry is this Western... It's not my definition. No, I know that. But it's, it's this Western Museum's search for a global modernism, and it completely yeah. flattens out these ideas. Yeah. I won't name which museum, but there was a museum curator who came here, saw a work by Esam Sultan, was like, oh, I'm sorry, we won't be interested in this. We're only interested in, in uh, abstraction. Like, if she had seen a couple sultans that she would have called abstract, but to say that sultan was not important to the modernism of Bangladesh is absolutely absurd. So I think, you know, it, it's back to, you know, there are different modernisms and they exist in different contexts, but it's this idea of trying to flatten the rest of the world into a Western uh, format that doesn't work. And that's what I really love about working in Bangladesh is that at least through the Asian Art Biennale, they tried to imagine their own platforms for modernity rather than adopt someone else's. I, 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 I will just refer to modernism as multi-modernism because modernism was multi-modernism from the beginning. So we'll just 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 change your subject, you know, like um, uh, I'd like to ask uh, <coughs> Nadia Sandani about uh, you know, how collecting is, is, is a big part of, of the Samdani Foundation. So when you collect, what are you looking for? What right. are your, what are the criteria that you set? So, are there any criteria <coughs> as far as collection is concerned? Okay, so um, like we say, we have two collections. One is the foundation's collection and one is our personal collection. So the personal collection is just very simple. It's Rajiv and I, we travel, we research, we look, we, we collect whatever we like. It can be anything from installations to videos to sound, really, yeah, the entire, it's the, open. The whole gamut of contemporary art. Yes, and not necessarily contemporary art, but uh, modernist, Modern I mean, anything, whatever we like. So that is not exactly, I mean, that's just our collection, as, I mean, that's our journey as collectors. But um, we have the foundations collection, which is, um, we collect South Asian art, and it is collected more in a strategic way where we have Diana and the team help us with the research. So um, right now, I mean, we're collecting, I mean, we do collect, of course, a lot of Bangladeshi contemporary artists, and all, I mean, a lot of Indian, Sri Lanka, and just name it, all over. and. They're collected strategically, like we're trying to now collect um, historical works. Um, something like, for example, if we've collected um, something like, uh, yeah, so historical works like uh, Pakistani modernists, Bangladeshi modernists, like for example, recently we acquired a Novera Ahmed, which we have been trying to collect for years and it's impossible so we feel that for Bangladeshi you know the works the important works which were before the 80s we're trying to collect those now most of them are in Pakistan or all over the world so um, when you say important I mean, how, how do you define that like so Diana, I, Diana seems restless <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. So sometimes it's interesting, so the, the collection is very much the initiative of Nadia and Rajiv and any, no work is entering the collection without their enthusiasm and approval. But what we're trying to do with the foundation's collection is to tell a story of these porous borders and shared histories that existed in South Asia. So which breaks? So where, where are we seeing the breaks in terms of young artists that are pushing the envelope or, or doing something that just might not 
fit, right? So I think when we're acquiring younger artists, we also look at it as a form of patronage. Like it's not an investment, right? We want to support these people to continue breaking the mold in whatever way they're doing it, if that makes sense. It's so, it's multi, so I would say that the works of modern art is a very strategic treasure hunt kind of thing. I've even had to go to Myanmar and call people in jail trying to buy works by a Burmese modern artist who studied at Shantanikaitan. The like war stories go on and on. But with young artists, it's very much about supporting people in, in breaking with tradition. And what is your position vis-a-vis uh, -vis works that are not archivable, that are not collectible? Oh, we collect like, collectible like, things no, no, like, all the time. Like, like performance art, like Prima Nazia Andalib started out as a painter. Now she's, she's doing performance art. I wouldn't mind collecting a performance art, but... Uh, how do you um, collect it? We <laughs> haven't. You, you, you become a painter. We have video... I mean, well, collecting performance art, art means, you know, you're collecting the concept. And maybe if you want to show the work, you train up people to do the performance. So it depends on really what what it is, right? Yeah, you can um, because yeah, because she's a new performance artist, and also uh, the videos that you do, I mean, you, you're producing are also based on performances. Uh, to be honest, um, performance is actually once I heard that that is this is that is the future, and I very much believe that. Because why I believe that performance is a future, or maybe we are right now in that future that performance is very much needed despite the need of collecting or not collecting because it is a need of the time because it is important that art make a language create a language for social development and making a context to hold the experience that could really bring art some solution if there is a solution because it's great that we are having this discussion because to me art where it is going what kind of art we are producing what kind of artists we are now what we are trying to pursue gonna change in a flick of time because we are in a digital era so we never know in the next five years who's gonna be an artist and who is not so it's already not defined. So we cannot define anything right now. So we are really interestingly observing a time where actually we are ahead of time. Then again, struggling to create a present artistic journey or expression, which for me as a performance artist to see interesting to see that how I convert myself from an object, artistic object rather than creating an object. So it's actually, it's art and artist is never separate. So more and more I dig into the performance genre, I can see how it is not dividing art and artist separate way. It's actually built in together, it moves in together, it is actually giving us a new direction for a new artistic movement. So it says Renaissance. We are very much uh, we are very much in tune with the word Renaissance. So we never heard it after Renaissance. So maybe we're gonna hear it more in the future. So I feel performance got that that uh, thing, right. element, yeah, potential to do that thing. So that's. So it's a renaissance of uh, performance artists. You know, we're looking at. So um, I would like to ask Tanzim uh, to reflect on this. Like how today's artists are producing um, through their performances. Producing, they're not producing any objects. They're trying to produce. Also, in terms of uh, what. Um, Manzur Bhai uh, Sar was telling us that uh, the, uh, the non-archivable um, objects of, 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 of an installation artist, like installation is not archivable in Bangladesh, maybe in the West because it's a, it's, usually it's a, it, it takes up huge space, it's impractical for a collector to collect uh, a huge uh, installation. 
So these are being dismantled at the end of the exhibition. As an installation artist, I know uh, how it feels, you know, to dismantle the exhibition and take take it to uh, as a rubbish, you know, uh, back back to your studio. So, uh, what do you think uh, happening to to our to our art scene? Uh, will they survive in the end? What is your reflection on that? Yeah, I think it is a simple question. Yeah, it's, it is not a simple. Uh, it, maybe it's a simple question, but difficult to answer because it's an ongoing discussion on this ephemeral practice of art and how to preserve, how to sell. <clears throat> but at the same time, when I was talking about contemporary art, I mean, when um, idea itself is becoming superior than the medium itself, then the entire process is now changing, right? Uh, and also the stand or particular position of an artist is becoming much more superior than the medium, and then how to preserve it. I'll come back to that, but before this particular aspect, I also want to say, I mean, I always say in different conversations that we have this slash dogma in Bangladeshi art practice. Each artist has so many slashes, and uh, also because of the situation, artist slash curator slash researcher slash archivist slash uh, slash agent and etc 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 uh, institution builder. So there, I think even the institution themselves are becoming a certain kind of paradox institution. I'm saying because we overlap with uh, each other programs, we know the difference uh, between uh, alternative space and also uh, and the, uh, more established medium scale, large scale organizations and how differently they can behave to uh, democratize artistic practice. So what we are doing in Bengal, I can just give you an example from an institutional perspective. Now we are having a moment of deproduction for the time being because we are creating a new space, but it's a very sweet break we are having because we are looking back and we have done quite a few exhibitions in the last 20 years. Uh, building up, building archive, and also we have employed half of our team members who are practicing artists just to see how their artistic sensibilities and concerns can uh, help us for so each solution. Uh, because there is no other way than uh, artists to actually be their own agent too. I was talking with artist Ronnie Ahmed, and he was saying this sounds quite frustrating in Bangladeshi arts. I think in many parts of the world, that the artist himself or herself is becoming an agent of work and uh, I mean when we talk about this iconoclasm or criticality it's a paradox because artists is also doing a peer job and also making an expression on their own artwork uh, so it's hard to resolve this problem but Nadia rightly mentioned that you know it's the concept uh, which is bought uh, and, but still I mean we are just thinking what will happen in future I mean if this uh, non-longevity continues, then we need to have find different mechanism of uh, collecting artwork. I mean, for uh, performance art, what we see now, we either buy video or photographs or certain kind of object which is being installed, uh, installed. but uh, performance artists always say, all, also say, you know, it, it is not necessarily an expansion of their artwork sometimes. It can be a mere documentation. The authorship of the actual artwork and the transformation of the artwork through video and photograph and how it's been preserved. Will they be the same at all in white cube space or not? I think Diana would be a very interesting person yeah, to give an idea on that. I'd like to, like, to, um, like your take, Diana, please, I'd like your take on this, you know, like uh, how, how it is working out uh, for the Western artists because you, you are a globetrotting uh, curator. <laughs> not out of choice, but um, I guess. I surround myself with some quite odd people. Uh, so one of the people that um, influences me a lot, who we've brought to Bangladesh, his name is Sebastian Chikochki, and he's the chief curator of Mola Warsaw. And he's interested in collecting what he calls post-artistic practices. So, um, for example, could a political campaign run by an artist be a work of art? Like, so he calls something, it's like a rabbit duck. You look at it one side, it's a rabbit. You look at one side, it's a duck. So could it be art? Could it be life? What's, what's that place in the middle? And Poland is going through an extremely right-wing um, moment. Uh, and so the Ministry of Culture is funding a lot of uh, war reenactments. So basically, he used the language of war reenactments to get them to fund reenacting artworks from the 60s and 70s. So basically, also with the artists, so like with Rashid Aryan and with Lucy Lepard and people like that, 
they've been reproducing and recreating artworks that were important at a certain figure of time, and they've come alive. And actually, there's now a museum that's looking at collecting one of these reenactments of an artwork that was done in the 1980s by Rashid Arain. So there are ways to think about that. There are institutions that are collecting things that people would consider non-collectible. It's I would say it's a new, new might be the wrong word, but it, it's it's a new kind of class of curator or museum that's trying to be post-museum, like a museum 3.0. How do you get beyond collecting objects? How do you collect ideas? Could you collect old exhibitions? Could you collect movements? What do you do? So it's something that at least, you know, probably giving Nadia a heart attack, but it's something that I am uh, thinking about as well as we develop so that. So, Mandir sir, would you like to add something to that? You know, like how yeah, I think um, this is the trend of the future, but as I said, this will be one trend of the future, not yeah, the yeah, trend. Exactly. So we sure. talked about not the domination. Yeah. So non-collectible, ephemeral art, this will be one part of the arts. And artists practicing that will be used to not selling things, but yeah. doing things for propagating an idea. And ideas are important. Yeah. Theories are important, right? And so if you have art um, hosting all these ideas and theories, your art will also grow from one strength to another. I mean, I think international scene has a conversation with the local scene always. And if this conversation is somehow interrupted, um, I think neither of the parties really um, benefits. So I, I suppose this will be the case. And see, um, Bangladeshi artists are coming up with uh, installation art which are not only site-specific, but also minuscule. And when uh, think of Christo, this big uh, German parliament building he covered in Christo, white. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Christo, yeah. Sorry, for you, for sorry. So these kind of huge mega installation projects are not possible. In Bangladesh, because yeah. Yeah. if art is not owned, then nobody is paying for it. And you are paying from your own pocket, or some foundation is paying for yeah. it. Yeah. So what happens is, you like this last Asian Vietnam, uh, I've seen Bangladeshi installations are getting smaller in size. <laughs> Maybe they're hoping that someday... So it's a trend. <laughs> it's a trend. Yeah. Because then you do not invest in scale, you invest in intensity. And that is also equally important. Yeah, I, I, as, as an artist, I was in, always against scale, you know, because of that. Scale because is we live in a, important. Because yeah, sometimes living, it's very important yeah, in terms of your idea. The spectacle, isn't it? The spectacle yeah. has its power. Yeah. Yeah. But then after exhausting the spectacle, you come to intensity. Yeah. And intensity always persists, and I suppose it also is something which catches up with the audience. So if you are bound together, yeah, if your idea is intense, if you can't the flow is intense, yeah, then exactly. art becomes yeah. meaningful instantly. Yeah. Yeah. It's very important. Well, I completely agree with you. I, mean, I would love to catch up with you offline about some of these ideas. But one other thing is this idea, why does an artist have to rely on their art making to support themselves? Like, I think one of the strengths, Pakistan has one of the most dynamic art scenes, but also because the artists teach. So there is also a parallel form of income. Like, if you have another form of income, there's also a lot of Western artists who have left the art world, taken, like, regular jobs. Jeff Koons was a stockbroker. Not that I'm, like, okay. uh, not that I'm promoting Jeff Koons. But this idea, if your ideas can be independent from the market of your work, there's nothing like that. And I think that, you know, again, at a certain point, you'll have to give up the job to continue the, the art practice, but to just think that you'll support your work by art alone is, is not the right way to go about things. So tomorrow belongs to uh, the hyphenates, people who are, you know, <laughs> juggling things <laughs> at once. <laughs> hyphenates. Hyphenates. <laughs> yeah. Would you like to add? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, we should also, I mean, consider this uh, word aspirations. Uh, because there's an autonomy of art for sure and we're talking about large scale and small scale it's completely a personal choice of an artist but at the same time uh, spaces like yeah, we're talking about platforms like spaces like Kola Kendro always raises this question of commodification versus social aspirations and of course I mean, there, there needs to be a sort of elasticity and completely uh, individual take on it I mean where there, there is commercial aspirations where you have your social commitment and how you balance it and still you end up surviving in the market. But this is quite an interesting thing to talk about too uh, because we see this overpowering structure uh, which is very also important, which is kind of optimism. But again, I'm saying infinite opt optimism is a completely utopia uh, that a big scale organization or a big scale 
uh, Biennale is going to help the artist. I mean, of course, it is helping the artist at the same time how we are accommodating this diversity, heterogeneity. And when we have this kind of space, it will be really interesting to talk about heterogeneity a lot and to see how we expand even non-art in artistic practice today. And we haven't talked about, you know, the market of non-art too, <laughs> because we often now invite the poets, the anthropologists, a social researcher uh, in a white cube space. We are talking about healing through art and how it also gets its position in the market. These are all questions blowing in the wind. <laughs> so the doors are opening, op opening up for artists. You know? um, and with that uh, positive note, I would like to open uh, this floor to questions. So I'd like to <coughs> send this out to the crowd, the audience. Why cannot the country itself be a place of exhibiting? Why should contemporary art and publication be like, you know, inside a Biennale or some like, you know, uh, art form? I mean, when you go to different other countries, you have, the, you have at least the airport that gives a reflection of the art of that city or that country. Why cannot Dhaka, at least Dhaka, the capital, have more art or as exhibitions um, so that when people or like you know for us we should like you know what we see in the street is is basically heartbreaking I, I don't think it's art at all and um, yeah so I, I that, that, that has, that's been my question for a long time I, I just wanted to ask this I had to opportunity thank you so I used to be very passionate about public art, so that idea of, you know, a public, beautiful public sculpture in a roundabout. But actually my take has completely changed after working for a Doug Art Summit. Um, because I really feel that all art, if given the right platform, could be public. So you mentioned an airport. To me, my heart, I have a heart attack every time I go to the Bombay airport. Why? Because there's paintings with a moving railway right underneath. It completely, the carpet, it kills the aesthetics of how you experience that work. If you have, let's say, we're looking, we'll, we'll use Bangladeshi modern art in Kipria. You need a quiet, meditative, well-lit space to, for that artwork to come alive. And the streets of Dhaka are not a place for that to happen. Also, you know, there's security, the safety of the artwork. Is it going to get dirty? Uh, like, with, with public sculpture, I'll give you an idea. If there is, um, let's say, an open vessel and water gets inside, is it going to breed mosquitoes? Uh, you know, so and is someone going to is someone going to build a horrible red building behind it, and suddenly the artwork dies? So I felt what I, you know, and I never, I don't take any credit for this. Um, but what's amazing about Bangladesh between the Dhaka Lit Fest, the Bengal Classical Music Festival, the Dhaka Art Summit, is there's huge amounts of public that come to these events. So it's actually about the same that you get in the airport, but you're able to control the environment and make it a public place to enjoy art. So I would say for me, Dhaka is a richer place to experience art in the city than Bombay is. Because in Bombay, it's in, I mean, there's great shows and galleries, but they're really small and they're really elite. Um, so I agree there should be more, but I don't think uh, large public sculptures is the answer to that. Uh, yes. Whatever are remaining, they are patchworks of color. That really adds color to the landscape. And I suppose since we have the landscape, it is so abundant. Uh, in October, to go there and see this, um, the fields, which are all very green, all very orange and everything. So it, it shows that we have a potential. Mm -hmm. But I suppose where artwork is a built-in experience in households, like these Alpana things, you don't need to display them in a public space. And I suppose the airport is not the best place to display art because 99% uh, people in the airport have anxiety uh, uh, impulses. So I, I, I don't think that's a place where you contemplate. Uh, you have to rush to the next plane or you, you go to the customs and immigration and you are not in a frame of mind to appreciate the best of art. But your point is well taken. I suppose the buildings can show and uh, we, have, we should have more galleries, right? We should have more galleries and uh, younger artists should have a display place. Not the very old. We are all mentioning Kibria and Jain uh, al We haven't even mentioned one very, very recent painter who is working on working directly to find, trying directly to find a space to display their artwork. Yeah. Any other question? 
So I would like to... No, not at all. I said infinite deconstruction. Okay, infinite deconstruction. <laughs> all right, let's say I'm um, quite a... Do you find... I mean, what you see, will you please elaborate on that? I mean, in form of explanation, like um, infinite deconstruction. I mean, what do you mean by that? And if you find okay, okay. infinite, infinity, <laughs> okay. you should be an error. Oh, I will. I think we, we all use all these words as tools to think or make a position, right? So when we talk about this post-truth society or post-history society, it doesn't mean we are rejectionists, we are rejecting the history, right? It's more like a, an expansion of the history uh, in a much more critical way when you also look back to the history, go back there and look at all this, uh, I mean, the history which is known as marginal history, feminist history, uh, nomadic sensibilities, indigenous knowledge, and you put them all. So it's more like you create your own hyper theory, or hyper, uh, I mean, you meta narrative in a better way. But you also oppose the grand narrative, right? So I think it's a back and, back and forth process of also solving a problem, then only deconstructing, because uh, the way uh, uh, most of us are also say once that we are in a post postmodernist era. So it means you know you you have to recontextualize after decontextualizing. There, that's why I say, you know, infinite contextualization uh, is not going to give us a solution, maybe. But the word was deconstruction, not decontextualization. Not deconstruction too, like deconstructing a certain kind of well, iconoclasm. Like when you, you, I mean, it's really important to create an icon, uh, value creation, and also at the same time value judgment, right? It's a critical process. So back and forth to both might be needed at this moment then only the value judgment itself in our criticality or critical conversation. All right, thank you. It's, it's a complex subject. We can, we can <laughs> go on and on about it. Yeah. Are there any questions? We're going to take two more questions from, from the audience. Thank you uh, for this wonderful session. The thing is that my question is more like uh, when we're talking about the modern arts and the uh, traditional one and the contemporary, my mind was stuck with uh, the culture, the art form that we have already lost. For example, Muslim that we have. Um, so my question was: Is there so uh, the art forms that some of those we have already lost? Is it possible to revive them uh, for the time? So it was going it is directed to whom? So it, it is more like um, Salim Jusri Samsar, he yeah. mentioned about... Okay, if the cotton is extinct, which apparently it is, uh, for muslin, right? Right, right, the cotton is extinct. It's not only for muslin, there's other things, other cloths yeah, as well, right? Like so basic colonialism killed the root of the plant. The plant doesn't exist. Maybe one day someone will open a pot in a funeral. Uh, you know, sometimes you read about it in ancient Egypt, they open pots, they find seeds, they plant them. Maybe if that happens, then um, it could be revived. But I think, you know, this idea, so again, Mustafa knows this because he interviewed me, but like my mother comes from, my mother is tribal and our culture is lost. So this idea of like a pure culture that still exists that doesn't exist. Like it is this idea of purity or like reviving something that's lost, you're never gonna get back to that. You'll get something close to it maybe, but without the original cotton, you don't have the real thing. So I think it's, uh, you know, we can mourn what's lost or we can try to move ahead. Yeah, that's the last question. Yeah, the last question from the audience. Location-based and issue-based artworks are going on, like in performance or uh, installation or performative Science installation, site-specific. So, sometimes it's, uh, I mean, uh, like the community-based or something like that. How do you community interpret art and science? Yeah, specific. yeah. How do you really interpret uh, this sort of arts and uh, I mean, feature of such, which talks about, I mean issues and other things. Yeah, well obviously I'm very interested in that. When you come to the next Dhaka Art Summit, it'll be all over the next summit. I mean, I think we're in a time where you can't ignore these issues and you're also in a place where you're very lucky for the most part to be able to talk about them. I think some of the, the works and ideas that Bangladeshi artists are expressing would be impossible to express in India. Um, or in Burma, or in Thailand, you know, or Vietnam, for example. So I think that that's also, I would say that a lot of it's probably coming out of the Patshala school as well. Like, I think that 
I mean, activism seems to be an important part of the thread of uh, emerging, or not just emerging, in the last generation of Bangladeshi artists, and it's, it's very rooted to its own local context and creating its own place in the world, which I think is also coming out of 1971. You had to take individual responsibility in order for this country to exist in the first place. Um, so, I mean, I'm rambling, but yeah, I'm very interested in that. So, the very last question is from... Uh, hi, this is Aisha. So my question is to Syed Mujul Islam, sir. Uh, though it is said that Bangladesh is a country beyond any culture and religion, at present, uh, with so much scenarios, we are watching that the religion has become more predominant than before and people are less likely to welcome your opinions and ideas. So according to you, what do you think of where the future of art will go? Thank you. And, and true religion doesn't have any clash with art. So it depends on the practice of the people, I suppose. We will see culture is something which is always important to you. And it is always relevant. It always finds and discovers itself. And you cannot exhaust the resources of culture. So in the future, what I believe is we'll have newer forms of art, newer interpretations of culture, which will be sometimes overwhelming, sometimes there may be some lackings, but overall, I believe the future is, I suppose, how do I say it? You say it. You can see it. The future. The future is here. The future is here. Yeah. So yeah, we are, we are living in our future. I am at least living in my future. Yeah. So not you. Not the man. <laughs> That's why I'm not One journalist asked me, what's your future plan? I said, I'm living in my future. So what <laughs> are you talking about? So if I am living in the future and finding everything relevant going around us, when you grow up into my age, you will also feel the same. So it's a continuity which matters. We have to ensure that nothing in this continuous happens, that nobody forces anything out of the system. Like Muslim have been forced out by the colonialists. We are reinventing Muslim. Now we are not exactly the same, maybe exactly the same thing, but remember we live in an age of simulacrum. Yeah. We make copies and copies and copies, origin is lost, nobody regrets it. Yeah. So maybe that's the future. As long as but I'm very optimistic. I'm very optimistic and because you have raised this question, that gives me another ground of, of for optimism. Yeah, because the cultural tensions of our day are being stoked by many, many false ideas. So as, as Munzirul Islam said that uh, true religion has, uh, you know, uh, will not meddle with your, your art, your practices. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, so with that positive note, I would like to end this session. And thank you very much to each and every panelist here. I would now like to invite Professor Imran Rahman on the stage to present our guests with uh, Yulab Souvenirs. Ms. Nadia Samdani. Ms. Nazia Andali Prima. Ms. Diana Campbell. <laughs> Professor Syed Manzurul Islam. <laughs> Mr. Tanzeev Wahab. And our moderator, Mr. Mustafa Zaman. May I now invite uh, Professor Ibrahim on the stage for the Thank you very much to all students and faculty for attending our uh, event and particular thanks to our panelists. Uh, we are a liberal arts college, you can say. Uh, University of Liberal Arts and 
General Education Department has the responsibility to operationalize it, to give an exposure to our students, uh, all uh, arts. So this was a great occasion for us. I hope uh, the students will uh, be more attracted. We have heard about a lot of uh, perspectives from very artists, art critic, curator, and everybody. But the real thing is to see the art, enjoy it, and only then we can really appreciate what has gone on this stage more and more. Thank you very much.